Welcome to Coffee House. This is the discussion, the anti-Mary Exposed discussion. We already have the companion piece that was the full book discussion. It was a mammoth one, too. There was so much to go over on that one. This is just diving deeper into the ideas that were kind of broached in that particular book. So, if you'll recall, or you don't have to recall because I'm just going to remind you, the subtitle of The Anti-Mary Exposed was Rescuing the Culture from Toxic Femininity, and it was by Carrie Gass, Ph.D. So it was discussing toxic femininity in general, and through the lens of what Mary means to the Catholic movement, and how she represents the ideal female. So what I was thinking about related to that was the effect of gender roles. What they are, what they're useful for, whether they should be useful, whether they should still be practiced or encouraged. That's kind of my question. So gender roles are built in. Like I said in the book discussion, this isn't like we were, as a species, just kind of plucked from a vacuum and then plugged into the world. It's not like that. We have a, a long history that our biology and psychology, our phenotypic expression, all of these things are built around this history, variations on this history, and recombinations of this history. So the gender role ideas, you know, as memes, we try to separate them out and say that they're something else. Uh, they just go into our brain, they're not actually us. But these things are built in. There's something that has a long, long, long history. And the way that I look at it is that we're all traveling in a direction. Gender roles are kind of this paved, nicely lit path that we can see down. It's something that we've been following for a while. And it's something that would be easy to keep following. And it's more likely we'll be able to get to a wonderful destination faster using this path. Now there are other paths. They might have kind of a dirt path with a bunch of foliage around it, so it'll be a little painful to go through it. And some might have no path at all that we try to take. Some might even get you lost or send you going in the wrong direction. But you have to pick one of the ways to go. Now the way that I look at it, specifically gender roles, is that gender is not determinative. It's not actually, and we're using gender here as kind of a concrete medical term here, so if you want to switch it out for sex or something like that, then it's, it's using the term where it actually means something, as opposed to what is bandied about today. So I'm going to keep saying gender, but you can institute just biological sex and the attendant inclinations and disinclinations and the constellations of characteristics that go around those biological distinctions. But anyway, so for our purposes, however, gender is not determinative of that. You have archetypes. You have a male archetype that has certain expressions, and you have a female archetype that has certain expressions. So a male archetype is something that would be expressive of or engaging in authority, being objective, exhibiting emotional restraint, and exhibiting conscientiousness or long-term thinking. The female archetype would be one that exhibits nurturing, empathy, creativity, support, and be life-affirming. So on the flip side of the archetypes, there would be the toxic aspects of the archetype. So you could have toxic masculinity, obviously everybody should be aware of <laughs> that one by this point. So toxic masculinity would be something that it's abusing authority, it engages in violence, dismissive of suffering, and is dangerously competitive. Toxic femininity, however, is something that we talk about much less, but it would exhibit being purely subjective, being manipulative, and being overly emotional. So either physical gender can embody various combinations of any of those elements, from the archetype, the positive archetype, for male or female, and the toxic aspect of both of those things. It can be any combination of those things. But what you need is to be able to have all those things expressed in the most, most efficient and effective ways, all the positive ones, and being able to restrain the ex exhibition of the toxic ones. So, okay. Now the other question is, because if you have these gender roles, it's not just that there are roles. And obviously in Christianity, this is one of the things that they would put forth when it comes to, okay, so one of them better than the other? They say, no, well, they just have, it's <laughs> separate but equal, right? And that's something that's certainly tough to buy. So generally, when you have a role, you're going to have some kind of hierarchy, implicit or explicit, real or imagined, when it comes to these roles. And so in this case, and I think throughout history, it would be easy to say that there's some kind of male priority when you are deciding on these roles. But the reality is, of course, that we're not actually in a movie. There's not actually a protagonist. And that's the question. It's it's a matter of, of ego, of self-importance. But there's no actual protagonist role to be had. 
there's no actual story being told, uh, religious or not, you wouldn't be the protagonist. You know, if you're religious, obviously the, the deity is the protagonist. <laughs> and if you're not, there isn't one. <laughs> but whatever the case, you wouldn't be the point at which the universe turns. I will also pretend that we are the protagonist, of course, and I'm totally fine with that because that's how we get through this whole thing. But whining about someone else being the center of attention, you know, whether you are the female archetype and you're whining about somebody else getting the attention or you're just the male archetype who's not particularly impressive, it's, uh, it doesn't matter. For every man who puffs up and gloats about being the king of his castle, he's the jester in a better man's kingdom. So the question of priority and the question of which one's supreme, which one's more important, that's not so much an important question. Okay, but so going forward, obviously anybody can embody either complementary archetype. You just need both to have harmony. And this is what comes from our history, you know, evolutionary history. Obviously a religious person would say that this is just something that has always been, this is how God made it, whatever. But either way, you need both of those sides for harmony. So when it comes to the archetypal male features and the archetypal female features, you need that balance to, you know, raise children, to have a society, <laughs> to do all the things you need that balance. Now, of course, religious people will have a problem because they see it as gender defined. They see it as whoever's the biological gender of male should have that primacy and should be, you know, the head of the household, etc. Feminists will have a problem with it because they always have a problem. They're just going to have a problem with everything. But these archetypal roles should be maintained, even if they have to be called something else. But of course, they would have to be have their name changed just for purposes of sparing feelings. But there's a yin-yang simplicity that balances out the family when you have these two poles that are working together on this. And of course, when it comes to the structure of society, the family unit is the most important buttress against threats. Because you have these strong units that are able to move about in the world, and they have foundational support so that we don't end up with skyrocketing suicidality and uh, drug overdoses and depression and anxiety. So overall, of course, uh, the book itself would be perfectly fine with gender roles. It would take its tone and the characteristics of how those roles play out from the Bible itself, from the Hebrew Bible and the New Testament in particular. But society at large right now, it's definitely pushing the other direction, saying that these can't be the case. Now, there could be some light at the end of the tunnel that comports with what I'm saying, is that it's not specifically based biologically. That you can have somebody of either gender, just like you'd have somebody of either gender who can have 180 IQ and do incredible things. You can have somebody of either gender who exhibits whichever archetype. And maybe on the other side, you get to the light, and that's where we're eventually going to get to. But right now, there's such a weird mishmash, and it's being abused by people who want to stay in power and gain as much power as they possibly can when it comes to what's going on with this whole gender thing and what people need to be doing with their lives. That's the funniest thing about our current situation, is that both men and women are being told specifically that whatever they are, the things that they are most likely naturally inclined to do are the bad things that they could be doing. <laughs> so for men, it's, you know, being manly and being aggressive, you know, whether it comes to picking up women or being competitive or trying to get to the, you know, the best in the company, being the massive breadwinner so that you can win yourself a, a lass, have your princess, all that kind of stuff. It's all those things are being called out as some something that's toxic something that's bad. Even though most men, generally, especially if they're exhibiting those archetypal features, that's what they're naturally inclined to do. So that's what feels good. That's what's going to get them the serotonin <laughs> that's going to make them more inclined to do those things. And so when you're constantly telling them from every which way that those are the terrible things to be doing, then they, they get confused. They don't know what to be doing now. So they think, okay, the thing that I want to be doing is some horrible sin, so therefore I have to feel really bad all the time and now I don't know what to do. But it's the same thing with women. Women have the same pressures that are saying that, okay, what is most likely your natural inclination that comes from millions of years of evolution <laughs> is that you are wanting to be nurturing, empathetic, to engage in mothering or actually be a mother, all those things, and all those things are being demonized and being told that those things are bad, that they shouldn't be doing those things. So you have the two poles, the two genders that are being just bombarded with this dissonance that's saying that, okay, all the things that you're naturally inclined to do that was the great thing to be doing throughout all of history and that you're biologically just driving for, all those are terrible. Do the opposite and um, do that because we told you to do it. 
Also, we're taking away your family because we're breaking up families and telling that you should be turn, you know, a turncoat in your own household for anybody who is uh, committing, you know, the act of wrong thing. So there's a lot going on, a lot going on right now. Now it's difficult because obviously this book specifically has this uh, veneer of pure religiosity <laughs> that it's just coming from that perspective. But I think there are much deeper foundations related to most of the points that are made. Like I said, there's a long history of our development that has to be reckoned with when you're trying to understand why is it that people, when they are the most economically sound in the Western world right now, why are they the least psychologically healthy? That's something that we have to reckon with. We can't just ignore that. Because if we were just perfect tabula rasa, which is, kind of, which is absolutely the proposition that's being put forward by the feminist side, is that uh, we're starting at zero. You know, it is a religious idea, is that we're starting at zero, we're kind of plugged into the world, and then all the outside just beats us into one way or the other. <laughs> and the real you, you know, the uh, noble savage you, is the one they're trying to get to, and that one just happens to be the thing that's going diametrically opposed to all the things that would seem like they were completely natural. So it's most certainly a strange time. It's a, it's a strange time when it comes to what the genders need to be doing. And it's sad because obviously there are tremendous strides being made that have already been made in much of the Western world and are being made in much of the rest of the world when it comes to obvious things, you know, the obvious things that we need to push for, like women being, <laughs> having control of their own fertility, <laughs> of uh, being, in, being able to engage in the body politic, all that sort of thing. But I think in this point, at this point in our, in the history of Western civilization, we have corrected too far on the other side. And we're telling women that they have to be X or Y, and they can't be, the irony that I would use those letters, of course. <laughs> they can't be the things that got their mother's mothers to this point, or their mothers to this point. That they're wrong in some way. That's another way to wedge them between them and their family. But, I mean, I think overall we're going to have a backlash where people are going to start realizing that that family unit is much more important and that we can't just keep piling on these dissonances that at some point we're going to have to stop and say, okay, there's a reason that freedom is the most important thing and there's a, <laughs> there's a reason that that's what's the driving mechanism of all of all the things that we've created, you know, over the past few hundred years. We have to get back to that, and then we have to realize that society itself, for all the social constructivist talk, that society itself is having the effect of pushing people in the ways that they're acting now, as opposed to just revealing who they truly are. So, anyway, that's a, that's a discussion. That's a good discussion. That was a lot, of, a lot of fun to talk about. There's so much to... I would love to just do this for three hours, honestly. I'm not exaggerating in the least. I would love to just talk about all the different points in this book for three to six hours and just go over each one and really dive deep into this stuff and have a lot of fun with it. Maybe at some point we can actually do that sort of thing. And maybe I'll get a nice co-host so I can have somebody to bounce off of who can uh, have some kind of a blunt instrument if I'm going too far off the philosophical deep end. And we're going to say that was the discussion for the Anti-Mary Exposed. And next we're going to have Jordan Peterson just starting this thing. Uh, you know, obviously I've seen a lot of his speeches and things and his lectures. So I know a lot of what he's talking about, but it's, it's going to be great. It's going to be great going through his first book like this and then going through his second. I'm really looking forward to it. And um, then we'll have that one coming up next week and the article coming up on Saturday. So anyway, thank you. Thank you for listening. I will see you on the next one. This is Coffee House. Bye.